So we'll uh, do some special topics and uh, these topics come as uh, applications of Fermi statistics that we have learned. So we'll learn uh, how to uh, actually uh, map Fermi surface of metals, uh, real metals that is. Uh, we of course know that how uh, the Fermi surface of uh, a free electron gas or um, collection of fermions, non-interacting fermions they look like. Uh, or rather a degenerate gas of fermions look like, but we will just uh, revise that once more. And um, in that connection, we will do de Haas Van Alphen effect, which was done um, in 1930 uh, on bismuth by de Haas and Van Alphen. And uh, this uh, relates uh, oscillations of the magnetic susceptibility as a function of the external magnetic field. And of course, we are uh, talking about uh, three dimensional materials here. Uh, two dimension is special and the application of magnetic field in two dimension gives rise to a number of uh, interesting consequences and quantum Hall effect is uh, one of them. And uh, I suggest that there is uh, another MOOCs course of mine on quantum Hall effect which you can um, have a look at uh, which in details talks about uh, uh, the effect of uh, this transverse magnetic field or perpendicular magnetic field on um, electrons that are confined in two dimensions. Uh, these are free electrons um, and uh, this gives rise to the uh, what is called as an integer quantum Hall effect. I um, will not talk about it here, rather we will talk about uh, these uh, applications of magnetic field in real materials and uh, these uh, mapping of the Fermi surface. So, just to remind you the Fermi distribution function. Uh, Uh, if you plot it uh, as a function of uh, uh, f of epsilon and if you plot this as beta epsilon minus mu where epsilon are the single particle energies, um, mu is the chemical potential and uh, beta is uh, 1 over t or 1 over kt and uh, we get a distribution which looks like this and uh, all these states inside the uh, this uh, box that you see or the step function that you see are filled and all the states that are uh, larger than epsilon equal to mu is empty. So, this actually corresponds to uh, epsilon equal to mu and uh, uh, so this mu at t equal to 0 is called as a Fermi energy okay? and we denote it by epsilon f and one can write it or rather um, uh, related to this h cross square k f square over 2 m where k f is called as a Fermi wave vector. And um, what is a Fermi wave vector? So, if you have um, n electrons and if you start you know putting them in this uh, say this k x and k y and k z direction uniformly. So, you fill in states. Uh, and uh, pertaining to the condition of uh, the Pauli exclusion principle and uh, then you keep filling these n particles or n fermions and um, if you uh, grow isotropically from the origin by putting them and if you have n electrons you actually get a Fermi uh, surface which is spherical in shape and that Fermi surface has a radius which is given by Kf and that is called as a Fermi wave vector. Now, uh, when you go to finite temperature, uh, so let us just uh, talk about plotting it versus um, epsilon minus mu and uh, then when you do it uh, at finite temperature, this uh, really gets modified just a little bit and so some spectral weight from here, uh, let me draw it by a color. So, this region that appears here. And uh, the concept of Fermi energy is no longer valid and uh, because the Fermi surface, uh, the sharp Fermi surface goes away, but one can still define what is called as a chemical potential. And this chemical potential uh, as you know that even at temperature which is room temperature, this uh, distribution is uh, minimally affected. Uh, the reason being that. Uh, the corrections to the Fermi distribution function is what we have um, seen. It goes as k t over epsilon f square. I mean the leading order correction uh, goes as this. 
and uh, this KT at room temperature is about 0 0.0025 electron volt while epsilon f so this KT this at room temperature which is 300 Kelvin and epsilon f um, typically is about say 5 or 6 electron volt and uh, this tells you that this is uh, several uh, uh, times larger like uh, 10 to the power 4, 5 times larger than the, um, uh, the so the Fermi energy is uh, this much 10 to the power 4, 5 or 6 times larger than that of KT and uh, one uh, actually talks about um, these correction to be very small and so the leading order correction to various quantities such as susceptibility or specific heat that goes uh, like this which come from the Sommer field expansion and all the activities that is all these uh, when you uh, give it give certain temperature uh, these are the uh, electrons that are going to be uh, you know promoted to energy which is larger than the Fermi energy and uh, this width is really uh, the KT and uh, you know each of these electrons have energy at, at temperature T as uh, KT. So, the total energy goes as um, KT into KT um, because this is the fraction of electrons that are excited. So, it is KT into KT. Uh, so, that gives you a KT square and hence the specific heat due to electrons go as T. This is what all we have learned. And, um, the Fermi surface of course is a spherical Fermi surface with a radius uh, kf, but it is important uh, for us to understand that uh, how um, the Fermi surface uh, is determined uh, for um, a real material and um, this is called as a de Haas van Alphen uh, effect and uh, it requires uh, one to um, include a magnetic field and let us see how uh, things can be done. Uh, there. So, uh, uh, and why is uh, uh, Fermi uh, surface or Fermi energy so important? Because the states that are closest to the Fermi surface, they are the ones that contribute to the transport properties and various other properties. Just like what I said, the distribution is only the electrons that are edge of that step function, they only take part in various uh, physical processes and that is why they are important. So, we need to uh, really know or map out the Fermi surface and uh, get some information about it, how it looks like, uh, what is the curvature and so on. Of course, uh, for a free electron it is just a sphere, but for real materials it is uh, it's not and it, it has to be determined. Okay. So, uh, the very physical properties depend upon the Fermi surface. This is what the main uh, message is. Uh, and uh, we will call it F s uh, in short if it comes and um, uh, so the shape is determined by shape of F s is determined by we use another abbreviation called as a D H V A effect which is called as a uh, de Haas van Alphen effect. Okay. Uh, so, which is actually the oscillation of magnetic susceptibility um, and um, uh, as a function of the field. Once again, I will uh, not do a very um, sort of elaborate account of this. In fact, uh, magnetic susceptibility is still an equilibrium quantity, but if one wants to do the Shubnikov de Haas oscillations of the um, either the resistivity or the conductivity, uh, that is a non linear uh, or rather uh, that requires one to go to a non equilibrium stat mech and uh, one needs to uh, take into account the kinetic theory. And uh, we only um, concentrate on the uh, de Haas van Alphen effect. And uh, so, this was uh, done by as I said de Haas and van Alphen and in um, you know 1930 
and uh, they did it at pretty low temperature this was at about 14.2 Kelvin uh, found out the uh, Fermi surface of bismuth. Okay. And so, uh, just to tell you a priori that uh, M over B um, that uh, shows oscillations um, or H over uh, yeah the uh, magnetization or this is called as a susceptibility. So, chi is equal to M over B shows oscillations uh, as a function of uh, 1 over B where B is the magnetic field. Okay. So, uh, there are certain uh, prerequisites that need to be satisfied and these prerequisites are the orbits of electrons. So, one of them is the orbits of electrons uh, remain well defined. Uh, this is a very important thing that um, even if the electrons scatter in real materials uh, still the orbits are uh, well defined. It can be actually stated in this fashion that uh, in fact, uh, these uh, electrons um, execute various uh, orbiting motions before they get scattered. Okay. So, uh, this tells you that the scattering um, is minimal. I mean scattering effects are minimal and uh, they are there, but they do not uh, you know um, destroy the orbits. And uh, also it is true that the quantization of the orbit remains robust. So, these are quantization of the electronic orbit and of course, we need uh, two more things a large magnetic field and small temperature. And small temperature uh, because the thermal effect should not uh, smear the Fermi surface completely. So, we should be at very low temperature. Okay. We will just come to this in, in a moment and uh, let me um, sort of uh, do a simple minded analysis and keep the analysis as uh, simple as we can. Uh, so, we write down the equation of motion for electrons in a magnetic field. So, EUM stands for equation of motion and which is nothing but F equal to H cross uh, K vector dot. So, that is a H cross K d k d t and that is in presence of a magnetic field it is E into V cross B E being the electronic charge V is the velocity of the uh, of the fermions or the electrons and B is the external magnetic field. Now, consider um, the component of the magnetic field that is perpendicular to V. So, this V t is a component of V uh, perpendicular to B. Okay. So, uh, which means that you do not need to worry about the sin theta between them. So, sin theta equal to 1 and um, in that case uh, you can write down a dk. Uh, is equal to E B over H cross and a V T D T. Just simply write D K D T as uh, uh, so as this uh, equation. So, D K is equal to this and um, uh, so the time taken for the electrons So, to complete one cycle is uh, given as uh, T equal to 2 pi over omega B and uh, this is H cross by E B um, and this is uh, a D T by V. Um, and uh, so, omega B of course, is equal to E B over M uh, and uh, so, there should be a M here and uh, so this is a dt over v and uh, this omega b is called as a cyclotron frequency so just to remind you that in presence of a magnetic field uh, the electrons actually perform orbits and this radii of the orbits are 
inversely uh, proportional to magnetic field which means that if magnetic field is large um, and here we actually talk about large magnetic fields um, and uh, then the uh, radii become smaller and smaller. In fact, this is one of the uh, pictorial ways to uh, visualize how quantum Hall effects occur and um, it is basically a, a edge phenomena and the electrons that are inside the, uh, so this is a 2D electron gas and um, you have all these electrons performing the cyclotron orbits here, they do not contribute to uh, any kind of uh, transport, but these ones they cannot complete a full cycle and they um, kind of skip. So, these are called as skipping orbits and these um, do not uh, get scattered at all. So, they, they remain very robust and uh, they continue to um, conduct uh, all these uh, the current and uh, one gets a Hall current and uh, eventually the Hall conductivity because of this motion of the electrons at the edges. So, uh, these are the cyclotron orbits and um, these they are given by E b over m. And now, uh, we uh, sort of know that your V t and p are perpendicular to each other. And um, so, we know that a constant magnetic field cannot change the orbit of the electron or rather the energy of the electron. Uh, so, uh, hence uh, they should move, they means the electrons should move in constant energy surfaces and these uh, constant energy uh, surfaces where their velocity is given by the band velocity. Uh, so, velocity is 1 over h cross. So, this is uh, uh, so this is del E del K and uh, so uh, the motion is perpendicular to the constant energy surface. Okay? So, the motion of the electrons is perpendicular to the uh, these constant energy surfaces and this const, uh, constant energy surfaces are important for us to determine and uh, they denote these uh, Fermi surfaces and this Fermi surface a typical Fermi surface for um, say bismuth looks like this, see a complicated structure and this is what has been uh, you know found out. So, the Fermi surface is mapped uh, by putting the material or this bismuth in a uh, magnetic field perpendicular magnetic field and you look at the uh, direction of the particle or the, rather the motion of the particle in a direction that is perpendicular to the magnetic field. So, all these surfaces that you see, uh, these um, are the constant energy surfaces where the electronic motion is um, uh, perpendicular to these uh, surfaces. Okay. All right. So, this DHVA effect, which is the de Haas van Alphen, um, that um, relates the energy of an electron. Uh, to the area of the orbit in k space. Okay. So, uh, basically um, you know in real space they also move in circular orbit and in k space also they move in circular orbit and uh, so um, consider two close by orbits. Um, in k space. So, we consider this uh, orbits in the k space and these orbits they look like they are circular orbits and uh, so, we consider two consecutive orbits and consider a point here. 
So, the velocity of the um, uh, of the electron uh, is perpendicular to this or it is in the radial direction basically and uh, this is the, uh, the tangential velocity. So, this is the tangential velocity and uh, so this is um, that angle theta that it makes and um, in k space the area or rather the radii are uh, they differ by delta k and this is one constant energy surface and this is the next constant energy surface and so on. Okay. Uh, so, the velocity is uh, these are basically the orbits velocity is uh, perpendicular to the orbit. Okay. So, here uh, V t is equal to V sin theta um, and uh, so your uh, B is in this direction. Okay. So, it is V sin theta which is equal to 1 by h cross and you del E del k will write it as uh, delta E delta k uh, and then you have a sin theta. Uh, so, if you actually bring this uh, sin theta uh, delta k over sin theta then that becomes equal to 1 by h cross delta E by delta k the transverse component of that which is delta k over sin theta. So, the time period of motion uh, is given by t equal to 2 pi over omega b which is equal to h cross over e b and now we have a d k divided by um, delta E divided by delta K transverse. Okay. So, that is the time period and if you do it carefully then it becomes H cross by E B um, delta E and delta K T D K and, and this is equal to H cross by E B uh, delta A by delta E. So, um, just to tell you that delta A is basically the um, area uh, between the two uh, constant energy surfaces. So, this is the energy difference uh, rather the delta A I am talking about delta A is the uh, area of the uh, concentric region. So, we have considered uh, magnetic field and have uh, considered electrons uh, free electrons that are uh, subjected to this. So, they would um, execute these. Uh, so, the equation of motion is given by, um, by this which is um, a minus E V cross B that is a force and then uh, we take a component of the velocity that is perpendicular to B and uh, then write down this d k and um, then we can actually calculate this uh, 4 pi k square dk um, and uh, so this will give you the area of these uh, orbits and um, uh, then we calculate what is the time taken for the electrons to one uh, to complete one orbit a uh, full orbit uh, with this velocity that are uh, that is perpendicular to b and uh, then uh, we uh, uh, consider two such orbits with this velocity perpendicular to the b and find out that the time period of uh, motion of the electrons around this orbit it goes as uh, h cross by e b uh, delta a by delta e. Okay. So, uh, what does it give you? Uh, the energy is of course, energy of the electrons that we know is given by n and k z this is uh, n plus half h cross omega b uh, plus uh, h cross square k z square over 2 m. And there is something uh, important here. We uh, in 2 d uh, with a, a parabolic dispersion we have this density of states that um, is constant and uh, this is like epsilon f. So, this is the density of states let us call it uh, d epsilon or uh, g epsilon whatever you want to call it. And uh, now, this is the uh, without any magnetic field. Now, with magnetic field you have uh, these um, uh, 
Landau levels that are formed you know at equal intervals and uh, these are n equal to 0 Landau level, n equal to 1 Landau level, n equal to 2 and so on and uh, these uh, the energy difference between them uh, is h cross omega b that is the cyclotron frequency and that is the d of epsilon that it looks like. Okay? So, uh, density of states which is constant and uh, up to E f now gets um, into uh, uh, sort of uh, you know they split up into various uh, these uh, discrete levels. So, the density of states looks like a delta function a series of delta functions uh, formed uh, these are called as a Landau levels these n equal to 0, n equal to 1, n equal to 2 are called as a Landau levels and the energy spectrum looks exactly like a um, harmonic oscillator in presence of a magnetic field. Uh, it, this is a two dimensional um, electrons and this uh, in the third dimension it still behaves like a free particle. Okay? So, there is a magnetic field that is perpendicular. So, in the direction of the field uh, it still uh, goes as a free particle and in the plane the magnetic field uh, makes these energy levels of the electrons quantized and these are called as the uh, uh, Landau levels and these Landau levels the important thing about the Landau levels is that um, they are heavily degenerate they are the, and the degeneracy is uh, it goes like B over some phi 0 um, where so this degeneracy per unit area so this is called G over A that is uh, uh, B by phi 0 where phi 0 is called as a flux quantum which is H over E. Okay? So, we are taking that um, input that the energy level in 2D is n plus half h cross omega b um, n being the Landau level index and uh, these are from um, n equal to 0 to n equal to 1 to n equal to 2 and so on. So, the energy difference between orbits between various circular orbits that we just talked about um, is uh, h cross omega b and uh, you know. Uh, so, one should uh, be able to relate now the delta A that is the energy of this uh, concentric region uh, delta A uh, to these h cross omega b. Okay? and this is a task at hand and that is not uh, difficult because your delta E is equal to E B by H cross square uh, 2 pi over omega B and into H cross omega B and this becomes equal to 2 pi. So, this 2 pi E B by H cross. So, uh, delta A that is the area between the uh, two concentric surfaces uh, they depend only on B. Okay. So, uh, now consider a three dimensional uh, problem. So, extend to 3D because uh, real materials are 3D and what happens is the following. So, you have all these orbits and they extend all the way up to the third dimension and so this is the B is shown as perpendicular to that and uh, you have these tubes these can be called as a Landau tubes and these Landau tubes are kind of you know stacked uh, like this whose projection is uh, shown here on the plane and um, uh, basically we will see that uh, these uh, red dotted line that you see is actually the Fermi surface. Okay? So, this is the scenario. So, you have uh, these um, electrons uh, orbits uh, now they are stretched into three dimensions. So, they become like uh, uh, you know all these pill boxes. So, these each of this of course, uncovered uh, pill boxes and uh, they kind of you know uh, get stacked and uh, we will uh, see that this has nice uh, implications on the kind of things that we are trying to talk about. So, we extend it to uh, three dimension. So, it will create quantization um, along the z axis because of this h cross square k z square by 2 m and we have this Landau uh, uh, tubes that are formed 
And uh, so, uh, what happens is that as we uh, increase the magnetic field, uh, the cross sectional area increases. So, all these magnetic fields that you see, all these rather tubes that you see here, um, as you increase the magnetic field, uh, so the tube uh, has larger and larger surface area. So, uh, we just write that. So, as uh, B increases. Uh, area of the tube, uh, we call it as a Landau tube. So, let us call it as LT uh, increases. Okay. Um, so, uh, now it is very important to realize that for some particular value of the field, uh, the cross section becomes so large that uh, it breaks away from the Fermi surface. Okay. So, now why this breaking away from the Fermi surface happens is the following that um, the corresponding energy um, as you keep increasing B, the corresponding energy becomes uh, you know larger than the Fermi energy. So, basically the states inside the, um, the Fermi surface they get pulled out and that is why in this situation what will happen is that um, um, the energy. So, this uh, electron actually uh, jumps into the next cylinder. Okay. So, uh, this is what happens. So, uh, this tube, so it goes from one tube to another as the, um, the magnetic field increases. So, it kind of jumps uh, from one tube to another and this actually causes the oscillation. Oscillation is whatever physical quantity that you are looking for uh, because it uh, jumps from one uh, Landau tube to another. Okay. So, uh, the electrons jump from one LT to another. Okay. So, this uh, causes oscillations in the magnetic susceptibility. Okay. So, now uh, the energy difference between the two tubes say with indices uh, uh, n and 0 uh, is say a n minus a 0 that is the n uh, the area difference let us call it as delta a. This is uh, proportional to b and the uh, uh, Landau level index or this Landau tube index that we have talked about and n is of course, equal to 0, 1, 2, 3 and so on and so forth. Okay. So, uh, A denotes the cross section Fermi surface perpendicular to B, the magnetic field basically. Okay. So, we get these um, uh, oscillations and let me just come back to the oscillations uh, in a moment. And uh, so, uh, let us say that uh, uh, B 1 and B 2 are two values of the magnetic field. Uh, corresponding to two tubes. Okay. So, uh, we have 1 over B 2 equal to 2 pi E by H cross A 0 n plus 1 and 1 by B 1 equal to 2 pi E by H cross A 0 n. So, 1 over B 2 minus 1 over B 1 that is uh, let us call it as delta of 1 over B. Uh, 
uh, that is equal to 2 pi e divided by h cross a 0. So, um, the reciprocal of the field difference is given by 1 over f that is equal to delta of 1 over b which is nothing but 2 pi e by h cross a 0. Okay. Uh, so, the, this frequency is basically noted in experiments which is what you see here. Um, so, this chi is uh, uh, plotted as uh, uh, h or is actually b it can be uh, 1 over b as well then it looks a little different. Uh, in any case uh, here it is shown the original experiment is shown and you see that there are these uh, oscillations of uh, chi which is the magnetic susceptibility. So, uh, I did not go into details, but uh, what is important here to realize is that um, uh, one can um, relate uh, the free energy of these uh, electrons uh, by using Onsager's relation to this area that we have just found. Uh, you know to this area of this orbit or the tubes uh, you know the cross sectional area of the tubes. And uh, so, one calculates uh, free energy and from there one can calculate the magnetization and magnetization. So, uh, calculate uh, free energy um, relating to area And um, so, this is uh, f and then use uh, m is equal to minus 1 over v uh, del f del b and this is the magnetization and from there the susceptibility is obtained as m over b. Okay. So, this is what is plotted in uh, experiments and, uh, uh, and one actually gets this frequencies and this frequency as it is shown here it uh, truly uh, is proportional to the um, inverse of the area of the tubes and this uh, by mapping these uh, frequencies or by noting these frequencies one knows the area of these uh, you know the surfaces or the cross sectional area or the area of the orbits which helps one to map the Fermi surface because this is where uh, the, the so uh, suppose there is a Fermi surface like this. Okay, so uh, one actually uh, measures these uh, these orbiting areas and uh, they are related to uh, the, uh, related to the B, um, basically the perpendicular to that. And uh, then uh, knowing these uh, motion of electrons in each point uh, helps one to map the Fermi surface. I of course, did not do a very um, elaborate account of that, but just to uh, give you um, an uh, idea that uh, uh, there are these uh, experiments which are very important, the initial experiments uh, on uh, bismuth um, done you know nearly 100 years back now 1930. And um, this was shortly after Landau um, had shown that and the actually the electrons um, uh, they behave like uh, the oscillators quantum harmonic oscillators in presence of a magnetic field and um, the the formation of landau levels etc were shown at that time and immediately afterwards these all these experiments that is uh, utility of magnetic field in decoding the properties of fermions in a given material is uh, is found out and of course, uh, you know I have just shown a, a, a sort of representative Fermi surface It's certainly not uh, spherical and it would not be because there are these there is no uh, parabolic dispersion that is e equal to k square kind of dispersion is never there in real material and on top of that there are thermal effects, there are scattering effects and there are electronic interactions which all um, go ahead and renormalize these uh, k square kind of dispersion. So, it is hard to predict unless one knows through experiments one knows the Fermi surface and as I said that these electrons at the Fermi surface uh, takes part into all kinds of important phenomena 
such as superconductivity, such as you know even uh, uh, magnetic behavior, etc., or specific heat, and so on. And uh, so that's why it's important to know the uh, this Fermi surface and how it looks like for a given system. Okay. So um, I'll stop here uh, today, and um, uh, thank you very much. Thank you.